So it's become apparent that the US government and YouTube have kind of stifled people like me quite a bit. Because people like me review cartoons on the internet. Which therefore means that we have to mark our channels as for kids, even though we use obscene language and talk in a way that most of them won't understand. Yes, the cartoon I'm reviewing today is aimed at a demographic between the ages of 4 and 10, yet I am nearly 30 and there's a bunch of people younger and older than me in my certain adult age group that will want to listen and pay attention. So apparently YouTube thinks that they can fine me for that. You can shove that straight up your ass, US government, because I've marked this channel as not safe for kids. <laughs> because I use words like this. Fuck, shit, piss, motherfucker, c <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I had to get that little bit of admin out of the way, because if I didn't address it, you'd all think I was stuck in a cave in the middle of nowhere rather than stuck in a building somewhere in the middle of East Anglia. Anyway, I apologise for how late this is. <laughs> the world can throw stuff at me and it just overwhelms really easily. I don't think that's a good showing of my temperament, but hey, this is beside the point. I am here today to continue analysing and reviewing MLP Season 9, even though it's been over for a month or so now and not much people really care. Then again, if you're here watching this, it means you do and I appreciate the viewership. So, Season 9 Episodes 14 through 20. It's time for you to have your skulls cracked open and for me to feast on the goo inside. Let's hope they're good episodes, right? On this, another missed episode edition of Pones and Stuff. Cheese Sandwich is back, motherfuckers, and he's here to highlight the stresses of autistic and creative burnout, depression, and loss of passion. Wow, this got heavy and surprisingly relatable quickly. However, while this is a departure from expectations, it worked to this episode's benefit as it brightened up what seemed to be a flat, monosyllabic and heartless showcase by ingrading a wheelbarrow load of thematic and contextual meaning to allow it to soar above seemingly dire prospects. While its story was predictable, the way comedy and drama planted seeds, sprouting independently of one another, ensured they never obstructed, making the whole situation feel like it was serious enough to require your empathy while making you laugh when needed to have a nice break from it. And the pace subsidised itself accordingly, even though some of the laughs felt more forced than necessary, meaning the jump between the genres felt more wonky than it seemed. The Last Laugh is a fitting title, as this is the final episode with Ponker at the forefront by herself, and to have her highlight her lack of growth at the beginning just added more fuel to the already noted positive fire, becoming quite a damning way to cast off the shackles of flanderization that have plagued her for so long. That being said, having her realise that she's okay with this, thanks to the uh, meaning behind the moral kicking me right in the gut, it was acceptable in context, so I can't be too critical. And speaking of which, the moral of reminding yourself to have first-hand control to how you create things despite the success you receive was beautifully executed just mostly down to its down-to-earth simplicity, using cheese as a vehicle for it, allowing Weird Al Yankovic's more reserved vocal performance to contrast well with Ponka's more exuberant take. It resonated with me as a fellow creator, and thanks to its positive messages about mental and physical health, it ensured the story could be forever inflated by it, negating many complications it would have had along the way. San Smirk, Cheese's assistant, thankfully wasn't portrayed as a grubby assistant looking to screw over their boss like Sven Gallup was four seasons ago, instead providing an earnest, sympathetic and concerned way to allow the story and character dialogue to have a direction without going round and round in circles meaninglessly. All of the characters in this slim cast then did their job to keep the train rolling and did so, having only a lacklustre accompaniment stopping them from taking it any further. The music gave me what I expected with the usual accord laced polka and punk as usual bouncy motifs, adding joy and emotive contrast to the grey factory surroundings, whilst the eponymous musical number felt derivative of Cheese Sandwich's prior works before showcasing flexibility and adaptability to make it stand out in its bridge. Despite that though, the repetitive nature of the BGMs when coupled with the sterile and surprisingly lacklustre visuals meant I was left pining for more, which annoyingly highlighted that the musical number had to carry a lot of its weight and it bared on its shoulders a bit too much, meaning that when I look at it, 
it was its major, major flaw. And despite that though, there were enough gag effects, room changes, transitions and character designs for me to put it up as a passable effort, something that isn't necessarily terrible but not necessarily great either. In short, what we have here is an episode lacking in substance that has been propelled up the ladder simply by how it utilized all of its tools in the woodshed to craft something meaningful and honestly stable out of a pile of spare logs. It was a bit lopsided in places and lacking in stability, I will give it that, but when the nail was hit right bang on the head, it went into that wood and stayed focused with authority to deliver what we got. Some more finesse and adjusting the tone more appropriately in some places as well as fitting itself uh, with a bit more than the barren visual framework we got would have helped, but the fact this episode still managed to achieve so much regardless makes me smile. It gave a fantastic lesson on how to operate as a working professional and overcome the mental hurdles that come with it. A message that was needed to be sung from the high hills, and it did so with the maturity that I wasn't expecting even from this show after so long. It may not have been on many of your favourite lists of this season, and honestly the series as a whole, but much like going to seed earlier on in this season, when an episode delivers all it can in a way that is so satisfying, who am I to judge it in any other way but positively? Overall, The Last Laugh scored a total of 18 out of 25, which is a B. It's a good start. Hopefully there are more episodes of this quality still to come. 2, 4, 6, great. Where in the bluest of hell do I start with you? Just when I thought Point of No Return was the worst this series could be, God, this shit stain walked up to the podium, farted into the microphone, and then proceeded to summarily defecate onto the crowd beneath it. And yes, those words are insanely hyperbolic, but my god, does it rather aptly sum up the loathing, hateful vitriol that I have for this episode. The idea of Rainbow Dash being in charge of a cheerleading squad sounded like a good one on paper, potentially gifting us the opportunity to challenge her perceptions of pressure, anxiety, social standing, and her tomboy gender role that would have made this much more than the shallow husk we got instead. Now while some of these things have been explored in prior episodes, it would have really shown just how much she had grown in the time since those episodes had aired, to realise that it wasn't worth fretting over and use her role as a teacher to assist the students to have fun and do well. Instead, oh, the, the ball was dropped so hard, it burst on impact with the goddamn ground. Rainbow showed no interest in this squad, and that line of conflict went nowhere on autopilot for around half of the episode's runtime, stagnating all aspects of storytelling, tone and pacing as it went nowhere fast, making it predictably uninteresting and uncomfortable in equal measure. And the third act had Yona, Smolder and Ocellus have our quote-unquote protagonist change her mind and through the art of montage took all the excitement out of that process. As we saw such a fast turnaround from all concerned, it was as awfully hollow, undeserved and jumbled together an ending that I've ever seen in this show. All frantically cobbled together to try and save some face of a song that was repeated so often in fragmented chunks throughout to where we're hearing it in full just didn't shower itself with the vigour that was expected, but rather contempt instead. This episode was visually empty, audibly stagnant, and morally dubious, with character writing and voice acting notably lacking in bite, purpose, or even sense. This episode ran all of its key characters into the ground for a Rainbow Dash ego trip that did not belong at this late stage in the show's run. She had already learnt to appreciate other ponies' interests from the moral of the end in Friend last season, so why this was considered necessary as a result of it, I will never know. Did the writers run out of ideas for Rainbow, knowing her wonderful journey and her parents had already been tackled? Lord knows, but like I mentioned earlier, a bit of depth and a culminative character study of how far she had grown since season one would have really made this actually quite lacklustre premise feel worth its weight in gold and capped off her story wonderfully. 
Instead, what we got stinks of painfully lazy writing, a lack of foresight, and most derisory of all, a lack of character knowledge that pile drives its absurdly poor efforts six feet under to where I hope to God it never is able to dig itself out of. The fact that this started off okay could have been good to see, but it spent most of its time with characters complaining, Rainbow being indifferent, Snips being a money-hungry bastard, and nothing came of any of it, yet everybody was smiling at the end, all happy, proving just how far it strayed from being in any way interesting. All in all, it showed just how disorganised and poorly executed this below the bottom of the barrel episode was. If the design of the cheerleading uniforms and Smolder's outburst to Rainbow are literally the only things that I can speak about that is in any way remotely positive, you know it has no hope to salvage just about anything. Ladies and gentlemen, without a doubt, this is the worst episode of this show I have ever seen. At least the extremely awful Point of No Return actually had something to offer. It had a message that was applicable to the story at hand to save itself. The message here? It was just waiting for Twilight to go, Aha, I told you so, I made the right decision, you should have seen it coming. Well, she didn't, and look what we got. An absolute train wreck. <laughs> to show you how bad this is, it hasn't scored anywhere, compounding its dire output, putting it in a class that only its appalling self can now occupy. For shame. For shame. Overall, 246 great scored a total of zero. Yes, zero out of 25, which is an F. For the first time ever, I've had to award the dreaded F grade and a zero score. I never thought it would happen, but this abomination achieved the unthinkable. It is quite insane. Following on from that dumpster fire should be the easiest task in the world. Then again, the show's staff didn't get the memo because they made it just about as hard as they possibly could. Why? Well, let me explain. Thanks to the episodes of the past, like Feeling Pinky Keen, Swarm of the Century, and Mystery on the Friendship Express, you can understand why the writers haven't put Pinkie Pie and Twilight Sparkle together at the forefront of an episode since season two, because outside of the fun investigative drama pastiche that Mystery on the Friendship Express was, we've not seen the book smart and the brainless prove that they have the chemistry to make their adventures together enjoyable. A trivial pursuit, uh, sorry, I mean a trivial problem, goddamn copyright bastards, did nothing to rest easy those fears, especially considering that I had better ideas for this going in, as a simple and fun story was overwhelmed and overcomplicated by a conflict that became a burden. Opposites may attract, but here it made this pub quiz premise feel as pointless, coincidental, and surprisingly unimportant that such an event shouldn't have felt like based on the way the characters had built it up. This was an episode that should have relied on being a break from the seriousness of this season, giving us a welcome distraction to see characters flexing their mental muscles in the name of competition with laughs and honest to god intrigue along the way. Yet we are robbed of that because much like those prior episodes I alluded to earlier, even the best one of the three, Twilight's incapability to see Pinky as anything more than a brainless basket case ruined everything around it. Thankfully, a heavy dose of karmic retribution and the fact that we got to see Twilight's mental faculty decline at such an alarming rate over a quiz allowed me to smile at it while Rainbow Dash and Applejack's rivalry continued free from the shackles of the past with no restrictions this time. But it was all that was offered of real content here. The fact the writers had to make Pinky dumber than a signpost to make her contrast with Twilight is more saddening, especially when it smells of desperation for the conflict's sake more than a sincere attempt to show these two and how they normally would act under these kinds of pretenses. The fact that there were this many rules for a pub quiz 
and that Pinky, despite living in Ponyville for quite a long time, would somehow have never heard of it, considering it happened weekly and her bosses went to it, is beyond me. It made no sense, underlining just how fickle this whole situation is. This dire story offered up themes of teamwork, treachery and rule adherence against the tide, allowing its plot to function to a purpose at least, the pedantic nature of which set about itself only warranting failure, especially as the static location new to the animation's ability to excite, outside of a couple of balloons and the obvious facial expressions which you knew I would enjoy, with the music suffering under less cumbersome but equally irritating consequences as well. The message about taking part and enjoying time with your friends being more important than winning felt as tired as it could be because, like many this season, it felt like it was recycled from previous episodes. I could probably name a few. Four Weather Friends, Non-Compete Clause, The Cut Before the Ponies. You know, any episode that actually involves some kind of competition, it's not a good thing. It was thankfully though saved by Twilight's emotional delivery of it and the fact that we do all need a refresher of it every now and again. It proved that this episode at least bookended itself with pride despite having the characters chew the scenery for most of it. I was looking forward to seeing Sunburst and Twilight go at it here and have a battle of the brains come through with Twilight appreciating and learning that there's no harm in losing and being respectful and sportsmanlike was more important than winning which would have been a better message and episode outright full of excitement and tension but instead well this was nothing short to be a binged and cobbled together misfire. It had enough good things to tow the line away from being flat out terrible as some laughs, fun moments and the consistency of the score and message in totality managed to salvage something but boy was it a hard slog to get through. It had glimpses of what it could have been out in the open that proved comprehensively that overcomplicating something simple is pretty goddamn stupid. It was entertaining, but only when not focusing on the main duo, which just goes to show just how backwards this episode was. A different direction could have made it a gem out of a lump of coal, but at least it had the fire under it to ensure its smoke wouldn't choke you in the process. Overall, a trivial problem scored a total of 8 out of 25, which is a D. Yeah, I told you it wasn't the best recovery, but it is better than nothing, right? If there is one thing that I've learned about this season, it's that if the episode has Mike Vogel's name attached to the writing credits, it's a good one. Why? Well, he wrote the amazing episode that was Frenemies, which means he knows what the hell he's doing. Despite that though, I fully expected the summer sun setback would inevitably be a bland, frustrating and stupidly idiotic showcase of the main six's incompetence. Seriously, when you look at that synopsis, what else are you going to have in your mind? Instead, what we got was a stupendously fun, continuity-rich narrative balancing act between the main six coming to terms with Twilight's ever-changing role and subsequently theirs as well, and Grogar's evildoers scouring the Cantalot archives for information on that goddamn bell, while causing chaos all along the way. Speaking of which, Discord was here too, by the way. And what could have easily been a clusterfuck became an episode of high quality that kept the overarching narrative and the freshness of our antagonist's villainy alive so it could be kept sleepwalking to the finale with no worries about its own safety. It's not going to step on Legos, it's not going to hit a wall, it's going to go straight through that open doorway and full flat on the couch. That is how safe this ended up being. More importantly than the superb and shrewd character writing allowing them to highlight their constant growth, not just to the main six but throughout, Discord was present and outside of a few funny reality bending moments, barely did anything. He was told to do so and the fact that he did proved that he wasn't immune from the warm glow of change to the norm that this episode presided over for all concerned. Which, considering that that is a positive, considering that Discord not doing his usual shtick is a good thing, shows just how good this episode was. Hell, the villains worked together, growing from their last appearance. Even they couldn't escape from the goodness. 
The story provided laughs and tension, the voice acting was shrill and varied, the animation had enough to keep me mostly spellbound, lacking only in a massive set piece to cap it all off for its efforts, the moral about not judging people based on past behaviours and not panicking when shit does technically hit the fan were important support beams when the house didn't really need it, but they were there and made themselves noticeable. You could look up and see how well aged they were and how good they defined the place. And given the stupidly large cast on show, all of them made their impact and kept up with the steady pace to tell this simple story with confidence. In fact, the only problem that really showed itself in any form was the music, which accented situations and the emotions at hand, but often left those on screen to do most of the heavy lifting, meaning its overall projection wasn't apparent, but what it did do was at least something that it could fall back on. Overall though, this is an episode that doesn't require a lot of brain power to enjoy unless you want to comb through and connect all the dots for the continuity that this gave us in droves. And under the microscope, it showed very few problems, really. It's hard to talk about because the issues are so small and the positives are so big, but they can't be praised too much because of their subtlety and the steadfast job they did. It has to be appreciated and not mollycoddled and overhyped. This episode had its head screwed firmly on and made the most of the runtime to keep excitement up for the finale, making waves and not being afraid to test the characters who we had here who have been through it all before while still making it feel fresh and new. Through seriousness and respecting the viewing audience through those characters' actions, their consequences had much more of an emotional connection than it ever would have before. And it heightens what I've just said. It felt like it was something completely new, even though we've seen it before. If the music had its head in the clouds long enough to see the paradise that was created around it, we'd potentially have looked at a contender for episode of the season alongside Vogel's buoyant counterpart that had already been presented. Unless it has to make do with a rating it deserves, but will easily lament that it wasn't given the opportunity to surpass. Overall, the Summer Sun Setback scored a total of 20 out of 25, which is a B+. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is more like it. Can I have some more of this, please? She Talks to Angel finally gave me something that I was surprised we didn't get any sooner. An episode that tackled Angel and Shy Animal Horse's relationship. Was it worth the wait? Somewhat, and that is mostly down to how this episode handled that premise. Choosing to take a leaf out of She's All Yak's cultural adaptation playbook, having the bunny and the horse go through a Freaky Friday scenario, felt odd, perplexing, and strange, but the whole situation and their bickering livened up a plot that started on shaky ground thanks to how shoehorned the conflict felt, with Fluttershy acting so obtusely and carelessly towards Angel, whilst it wasn't brought into consideration just how much they'd been okay in the past to make this feel even more out of the ordinary. Thankfully, the episode acknowledged the changing of Fluttershy's living situation and working situation with the School of Friendship and the Sanctuary, and that it did have an effect on Angel to where his gripes were warranted, meaning it wasn't as ostentatious and brazen as it looked like it did from the outset. This helped heal the wounds as drama and comedy seeped out slowly from this episode's pause, occasionally allowing the pace to fluctuate for its own health, but still regardless remaining stagnant for large periods, sucking whatever life away from what joy could be projected. Regardless though, it still allowed us to see these two in different guises, and the efforts they went to was funny and entertaining, meaning its storytelling shortcomings can be subsidised by the subverting of expectations in the simplest way imaginable. This was helped in thanks no part to the limited cast sans the animals, as it helped allow this premise room to bloom without obstruction, as Zakora and Dr. Fauna served as expositional plot drivers, so the two mains could do the heaviest of lifting, without seeming to be obscured by it. However, it also meant that it felt rather thin, relying too much on Angel and Fluttershy to where they eventually became burdened after a certain amount of time by the task at hand, much to its detriment. Andrea Libman, though, well, her voice got a chance to show its tonal shifting abilities, being familiar but just different enough to ensure this swap had implications more than it let on and felt like it actually had an impact. 
meaning this whole thing would have flopped hard if she wasn't able to pull this off so valiantly. This was despite the fact that the tonic drinking scene beforehand felt about as laboured and intentionally executed as a way to manoeuvre the plot forward without thinking of the actual consequences of itself outside of this episode's narrative bubble, which kind of made me think, okay, from here, this at least proved funny, but you could have executed its build-up a little better. Regardless though, both characters were able to highlight their faults and their notable strengths without having to do such a thing, and give a nice sense of closure to their relationship with the message of allowing time for your friends, similarly noted in Student Council earlier in this season, being repurposed to create room for the supporting lesson of learning what someone else has gone through or have to go through to look pretty despite some noticeable bruises caused by the other factors I've already made you aware of. The music also, despite having some problems, felt alive, while lacking in genre diversity, had a creative use of a lack of the usual sound cues that Angel would have to imply that under Fluttershy's steering, she had an ability to convey her emotions and words, which was a lovely touch that added to the orchestral flourishes that amped up the drama in the third act that hastily and fittingly required it for contrast. Sadly, in terms of animation though, this floundered badly, as outside of the switching blur effect, which was only done a couple of times, it found very little to help itself, which, alongside the successful yet fleeting and middling but acceptable offerings of its peers, firmly roots this episode into the ground, making me feel as equally frustrated as I was entertained by this. Because when looking at the broader picture, this was an episode that... Well, it didn't do all it could have been, but it still allowed itself the room to make itself fun. I mean, the idea of Angel and Fluttershy swapping bodies should have been the cringiest thing known to man, but they went with it and made it what they could despite obviously stumbling over a few blocks. And honestly, it was worth watching at the end of the day. It enjoyed what it gave to us and it was battered and bruised by the time it finished, but it was still standing, which is not a bad thing. I just wish that it managed to nail down the perfect way to showcase what it had as an episode, because if it managed to, God, it could have been better, but it managed to do a noble job, even though in trying to showcase itself, it looked less than flattering. Overall, She Talks to Angel scored a total of 10 out of 25, which is a D+. Not bad? Well, it's definitely not that great either, so it kind of sums up this episode pretty well, doesn't it? You've surely heard of the phrase, curiosity killed the cat, right? Well, in this case, to paraphrase it ever so slightly, jealousy killed the relationship. And while it doesn't have the power of alliteration on its side, it still rings true as the culmination to the rarity and spike storyline, as it just came and went by without any real fervor, making minor splashes along the way without leaving the biggest ripple behind. In fact, I was left constantly while watching with a perplexed look on my face as I tried to justify the character's actions on display. Now, I fully understand that it's in Rarity's DNA for her to be the jealous type, for Spike to be dedicated beyond all reason for something he cares about. He is greedy after all. And for Gabby to be airheaded when it comes to understanding most normal social conventions because she doesn't really have many of those in Griffinstone, that all makes sense, but to see it all unfold here with ignorance of conventional social norms to procure the dramatic tension and story progression at hand, it just made them all feel so one-dimensional as characters and bluntly stupid as a result, almost as if it was done just to throw a monkey wrench into proceedings for the conflict's benefit. If so, it wasn't done with any subtlety, which it desperately bloody needed. For Spike to be the more reserved than he usually is, and not be open about his relationship with Gabby, Rarity going full ham chewing the scenery because she wasn't attended to, and Gabby being unable to speak her mind in disappointment on us being confronted, despite being acceptable for them, just felt so out of place here. Especially in the case of Rarity, especially should not have been this jealous. This definitely rings true when you remember that she was the one who just flagrantly denied Spike's advances so much over the years, or at least was willing to accept them within some form of platonic reasoning. 
and to see it all just kind of get thrown away for the sake of an episode just it just didn't really sit right with me. And everything I've just mentioned overshadowed proceedings to where it negatively impacted the pace, created an overly serious tone that hardly shifted acceptably, and it repeated the moral and narrative implications provided by both Triple Threat and Make New Friends But Keep Discord to where it could barely stand on its own with any form of originality seemingly staring back at me. But thankfully it made up for its shortcomings somewhat by having these characters learn from and grow from the experiences that were provided before us. This was done all while showing the true natures of their characters in a way that eventually worked in their favour to regain some solidity, as the voice acting helped paper over cracks with it, as the third act mended fences and gave it a satisfying conclusion that had been built up well despite the issues at hand. On top of that, the score kept up valiantly with the variety that the various characters and situations offered as well, which made its tonal rigidity feel like the correct decision to make to ensure it thrived. The animation though, well that actually needed a massive kick up the arse to be anything more than poor really, because thanks to time constraints and the fact that this episode needed to stretch its premise all the way to its end, we were denied the visual beauties that were the Power Ponies Comic Con and the Gem Canyon, which would have really added some visual clout to a sterile, if occasionally, well-lit offering. The characters complemented each other well and helped the fractured pieces of the story and visual experience come together when United proved entertaining and more well-rounded than it seemed. I have to commend its usage of montage and the repetition that it highlighted, especially for the emotional impact that came through at certain points, which made the story feel like it had more importance than it ever really seemed. And seeing Gabby again was an absolute treat, which I have to highlight because seriously, she is a cinnamon role who must be protected because she's so goddamn cute. Anyway, the implications of this episode were muddy to say the least, but it had some form of quality nestled within it to see its faults and repair them to a point where it remained on the rails. The model of not getting jealous of a friend worked better with Fluttershy, Treehugger and Discord, as I've already noted already, but it helped the story have direction and it worked with the characters at hand, while Triple Threat's trusting your friends implication didn't have the desired impact, it still allowed a nice refresher to those who like to take those who they care about for granted, because some people do need it. All in all, this episode is a divisive one. It did what it could to peek its head above water while simultaneously being undecided over whether it wanted to drown itself, but it never really went through with it because it knew it had something to tell. Some good laughs were supplied and it put up a good fight to close the door on Spike and Rarity's relationship in as bad as positive a way as it could without treading on any shards of glass and wincing at the pain, which I will commend it for, but I just wish it didn't have to pussyfoot around and cause itself more harm than good as it's displayed here. There are some great things nestled within here that really should have been given the room to sprout out and make themselves apparent. Even when they did, they were still overshadowed by everything negative to where I'm having to force it out here. The right framework was there, the right characters were there, and the right moral implications were there too, but... All it needed was to go back to the drawing board, sand out those rough edges, and fill it with more visual commodities, and it would have gone a lot higher. <sighs> I may be underselling it a lot. This episode did have its moments, and it gave me enough that I can be happy with it. But I'm still lamenting over what it left behind, because honestly, it's just sitting floating away comfortably on the lifeboat that it fashioned itself just so it could escape the cruise ship of mediocrity. But by doing that, it's left me very unsure whether I've made the right choice to give the grade and score that you're about to see. Overall, Dragon Drop scored a total of 11 out of 25, which is a C minus. I hope you understand what I mean, because what I've said in equation to that score and grade does not make any sense. I will leave it up to you to decide whether I'm right or wrong on this. We finally arrive at the doorstep of a horseshoe inn, and yes, that was a pun, you are very welcome, as this was Starlight's final hurrah, and well, she is my favourite character, I should have been able to celebrate her in all her glory as she mans an episode 
one last time. But that joy was short-lived because leave it to Trixie to steal her thunder and to character make it all about her. Now, while I fully understand that this was what was intended, it doesn't make this any less disappointing to sit through because honestly, they went a little too far on this occasion. Trixie herself may be one of the more consistently well-written characters in this show over its run, but Flanderization, the scourge it is, has finally caught up with her, where her sneering, egotistical and aloof attitude has become grating, annoying and frustrating to watch, repeating the same splintering threads that were spun from the same stained cloth that has lost its luster over time. This was especially the case here, feeling forced to ensure the plot had a bad guy to rub off on and progress itself forward, all while borrowing elements from all the prior Starlight and Trixie episodes to highlight that no matter the scenario, no matter the story, and no matter the amount of sympathies, these two have retold the same story of antagonism and reconciliation to where even I have realized its efforts had the same effect as a placebo, dulling the pain while the definition of insanity creeped in ever so slowly. The moral followed similar suit, borrowing way too much from all bottled up and no second prances, with the new entry about everyone having the right job for them, needing to be located and you having to be honest as a result of seeing where they land, being relegated to second fiddle amongst the petty squabbling and seriousness to where it barely made any form of footing. Even the snide remarks fell on deaf ears as the story managed to keep its head above water, faltering ever more so because these characters wouldn't stray from the norm that was expected of them. Starlight's conflicted nature highlighted why her character is so divisive. She honestly wanted to and could have done the right thing, but let her personal connections run way too highly, meaning that anything that could have been done realistically and smoothly was not done, which is ultimately where this episode stumbled the hardest, relying too much on shoehorning complications into a process that should have been easy to grasp and intriguing to see from the get-go. As a result, it felt like a slower, elongated, and more depressing version of Season 2's May the Best Pet Win, but without any of the enthusiasm and charm that that episode gave. Adding more applicants to the vice head mayor process would have made the progression feel less transparent and predictable, whilst more over-the-top antics would have freshened up this stale trot a bit more, which sadly we didn't get to see as we just saw stuff happen and Trixie making a fool of herself, but Starlight being too stubborn and proud of her own friend and the idea of working with her to really see anything else other than that. It was, it was really infuriating and it was an episode that knew what it wanted to do, but it was so lackadaisical. It didn't feel like it wanted to pull more out of the tank, even when it had the opportunity to do so, when the components were there for the taking. Although the voice acting, some plant-based musings, which were quite funny, and a few inspired musical motifs did what they could to save face, the animation was sterile and unremarkable, adding more fuel to the noxious fire that was being presented before me. And while this episode was important to fill out the expanses of world building, giving Trixie, Starlight and Sunburst something for their imminent future, it had very little else to show for its meager display, highlighting just how shallow this was. And it pains me to say it, but Starlight and Trixie's journey ended with a whimper. To where it is, uh, unfortunately, both characters. Worst episode overall. Yeah, this is worse than Uncommon Bond, and I honestly wasn't expecting that. Overall, a horseshoe in scored a total of 4 out of 25, which is an E+. Plus. What a somber way to end this selection on. In closing, I didn't want to make a statement, a sweeping one, that season 9's second half became a dumpster fire, but the evidence kind of highlights that, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, we had two great episodes, a couple of below average ones, and a few which were poor, if only slightly redeemable and quite disappointing, but when you have an episode that is absolutely the scourge of the earth, that has no qualities to suffice, I'm sorry, I have to look at it and say, the ball, like I said, was dropped so hard it burst, <laughs> to paraphrase my review that's already been in motion. The thing is, the season 9 started off 
and without me realising it, being really consistent with very decent quality episodes that were above average to good. And that's something I can get behind. Even though there were a few little roadblocks, there was still a lot of good things to look at, but here, it started off great and then just took a massive bloody nosedive and has struggled to find its way back. Uh, okay, when it managed to look at the overarching narrative and give a character something good to look at and go, we're gonna make their sign off be a pleasant one. That was nice. They just looked at the rest and thought, okay, we're gonna throw some stuff at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> I mean, much more thought could have been put into these episodes and it would have turned out much better, but at least it wasn't a humongous, burning train wreck for most of it. I can at least take some positives away and not be too angry. I I'm trying to retain my composure here, okay? Because I'm not done with season 9 yet. <laughs> I still have episodes 21, 22, 23, and then the triple header finale to get through. I am just hoping by the time we reach that triple header, that the quality at least increases. That's all I want. I just want things to increase, even by the slightest of margins, to be a little more showing of the value and the quality that this show can have. If it doesn't, well, you know what I'm gonna be doing next time round. Venting uncontrollably and making you all laugh at just how offensive I can be with my words. I hope you're all looking forward to that, because I sure am. I've been Freddie Thomas, you've been people watching, this has been the CC Network, and as always, I will see you all next time.